Lincoln at the Independence Cap, just off the Blue Line on Independence on um, Irving Park. Get it? Blue Line. That's <laughs> <Yeah. it. laughs> yeah. So uh, originally, I uh, wrote a piece where I did uh, an impression of Jane Lynch and uh, performed it for my wife. And uh, she said, "Personating women is hard." <laughs> <laughs> I ripped that up and uh, wrote something completely different. <laughs> uh, this is called Glee. When I was eight years old, I watched a lot of television. I watched every sitcom and cartoon I could possibly cram into my artfully large, bowl-cut hairstyle having head. I watched shows about robot daughters <laughs> and adopted black children, about aliens from Melmac and disgruntled shoe salesmen from Chicago, Illinois, about kangaroos with their own apartments, and superhero ducks. <laughs> I learned early on that white families eat dinner together when I was six, and always with large glasses of milk. I learned that you can build seven seasons around the premise that your roommate is from Europe. I learned that under no circumstances should men and women be roommates, because Don Knotts will shit a brick. I learned that if Robert Stack was telling a story about you on Unsolved Mysteries, you're fucked. <laughs> a million awful lessons posing as tales of American morality, teaching a generation of men and women that misogyny and racism can be solved in 30 minute increments. That you should be nice to fat people or people with disabilities even though it's not the popular thing to do. 90s television, who hurt you? <laughs> My heroes at that age included Paula Abdul, Pee Wee Herman, and naturally every young Mexican boy's idols, Mary Hart and John Tesh. <laughs> Paula Abdul sang and danced with cartoon cats. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. Paula Abdul was friends with cartoon characters. That blew my eight-year-old mind and reinforced my theory that all cartoons live in California and that the Muppets took Manhattan. In my head, Paula Abdul was going to marry Jesus Christ and there was going to be peace on earth because opposites attract. Paula Abdul was God's future wife and that was the realness. <laughs> a lot of kids at that age in my class had basketball cards and started forming their allegiances to Chicago franchises. Da Bears, Da Cubs, Da Bulls. I had a Pee Wee Herman doll and the board game. I had Pee Wee's Big Adventure on a green VHS tape that I happily traded for a Saturday afternoon worth of chores to watch it for the millionth time. Pee Wee Herman was an agitator and a rebel. He ate Mr. T cereal, fed his bullies trick gum, and went on a cross-country adventure for the sickest bike I've ever seen in my life. He encouraged furniture to yell, had a blue floating head that dispensed wise advice, and was the only white man in a suit and tie that ever smiled. <laughs> More importantly, he didn't give a fuck. Pee Wee Herman was dead. <laughs> Mary Hart and John Tesh hosted Entertainment Tonight. At the time, that was my CNN. <laughs> They dressed like they were going to an award show that they weren't invited to. <laughs> they talked about music, movies, and television, and they reported gossip like real stories. Well, they constantly lied and never corrected themselves. I don't know about you, gang, but they were way ahead of their time. I love John Tesh and Mary Hart. <laughs> 
They gave me rare insight into industry juggernauts like Rue McClanahan, <laughs> Ryan Austin Green, and the cast and crew of Designing Women. <laughs> they cut through the bullshit and asked America hard pitting questions like, is your dog overweight? Are Diet Pepsi commercials too sexy? <laughs> and who's OJ's new flame? <laughs> I loved John Tesh and Mary Hart. They were flaky, vapid, and the first credible news source to tell me that Gina Davis and Jeff Goldblum were over. <laughs> <laughs> Television was my babysitter, my irresponsible relative, my plucky, back-talking robot. Well, I set this mid-climax on my wedding night, and I'll say it again. <laughs> Murphy Brown is the greatest show ever made. <laughs> If you're not a ride or die for Candace Bergen, we can't be friends! <laughs> I was one of three brothers. My mother worked two and three jobs to keep us fed and clothed. We lived in a basement of a building that was not legally considered an apartment. Kind of like squatting, but you still pay rent. <laughs> At any given moment, any tenant in the building could walk into our home to change their laundry and the machines that were adjacent to our rooms. We were ironically not allowed to use those machines. This is why I have no fear of public speaking. I was public living. <laughs> the apartment was full of charming attributes like the toilet in our bathroom that was atop of a four-step staircase. The walls that were covered in random movie posters to cover up the cracks and holes. Which I explained to the very rare guests that yes, that is a poster for the motion picture cocoon. <laughs> I thought every little boy has a poster on their wall for fried green tomatoes. <laughs> Some winters it would get so cold that we would sleep side by side in my mother's bed. Dinner was either homemade Mexican food or Diner food smuggled out of my mother's workplace where she broke her back waiting tables. Tuna salad, open-faced turkey sandwiches with mashed potatoes, bread rolls and pre-packaged crackers. If a geriatric man sent back his brisket in Skokie, Illinois, <laughs> jackpot! <laughs> <laughs> At night she would collapse on the couch and we would give her welcoming hugs. She smelled like cigarettes and makeup. She smelled like french fries and coffee. We were always very relieved to see her. We hardly ever ate dinner together, and never with a glass of milk. In the fall of 1991, I joined the Chicago Children's Choir as an after school and weekend program, which I can tell you firsthand is nothing like the TV show Glee. <laughs> Instead of bright-eyed child actors singing fun pop ballads and learning awesome dance moves, we stood perfectly still and sang old, creepy Italian opera over and over again. Songs that you might hear in a horror film about the devil during the scene where it rains. <laughs> Instead of Sue Sylvester belting out cold, witty, well-written one-liners, I watched stage parents yell at their children for not being cast in the Nutcracker. Luckily, it did transform me from the awkward loner to the most popular kid in class. Nope. Actually, Robert Santiago announced that I was super gay, and then he and the other boys lived out the plot of the movie Sandlot or whatever. <laughs> Some of them are dead now. <laughs> school and during lunch, the program director, Dennis Northway, taught us tempo, pitch, and breath control. Most weekends, 20 of us would get onto a bus and perform at private events around the city. I hated the itchy dress clothes, but I loved the dessert table at the Wilmette fundraiser to save the whales. <laughs> I hated the boring long bus rides to northwest suburban churches, but I loved the catered meals and stuffing myself full of cookies and chocolate-covered strawberries. I met Oprah Winfrey, Hillary Clinton, and a rolled-up cocaine cake $20 bill posing as the mayor of the city, Richard J. Daly. <laughs> Fuck that guy! <laughs> 
patting themselves on the back because little black and brown children could somehow learn Italian opera. We were brave. We were proof that if white people were nice to us as children, we might grow up to go to college. Hmm. How many times a bedazzled hand of privilege rustled my black hair and said something like, Does he speak English? Oh. Muy bueno. Muy, muy bueno. <laughs> the good part of growing up glued to a television is that you find humor in almost anything. The bad part is that you learn the, the world is much more cruel and dark than the scariest tales from the crypt. I learned over the last few years that television is a very dangerous thing. That people like Donald Trump have been talking to your children longer than teachers, priests, and relatives. That we trust and idolize people in this country because they are rich. That money is success and a free pass to be a huge asshole. That if you have money and are from money, we will let you do anything you want. You can hurt women, fix elections, cage children, and kill the planet. You can start 30-year wars and set up recruiting stations in high schools when you start running out of bodies. You can blacklist black athletes if they even think of standing up for themselves or others. I am not without blame. I am killing the planet that I claim to want to save. I try my hardest to ignore the suffering world around me, staring at it in panels like a graphic novel I can open and close. I heard an interview the other day with a detained migrant child. She doesn't know what racism is. No concept of borders or flags just wants to go home. She sobs loudly into an NPR microphone and begs to see her mother. She begs. I collapse in my hands on the tray and begin to cry. I'm exhausted and constantly full of disgust. I lay awake at night listening to the ticking clock on the mountain above us. We are running out of time to do the right thing. I see myself in those children at the border. I see my brown face and brown eyes. I see my brown arms and brown legs. I hear my screams as they fall against coal, steel, Bars. Most importantly, I see myself in this corrupt, hopelessly racist country, and I am certain it is running out of glee. Thank you. Good night.